Hello folks, this is the lecture on how to make stuff beautiful. And I really wonder how you feel about this topic. Me, personally, I think we product and industrial designers are totally in the business of making things look wonderful. And it is my experience that a lot of design schools aren't really hammering home that point enough. Everybody is trying to tell you, yeah, make sure it works. But I think that's not doing it justice. There is nobody else in the corporate world qualified to make things super beautiful. It's us. We need to do this. And perhaps um, it is time to look at how this is done. Now, I've compiled this presentation here to show you all the tricks and I'll give you all the tips on how to optimize your objects so that they really look great. Now, admittedly, there will be a certain amount of talent required here, but if you haven't got that, there's hope because the rest and the majority of it really is technique. Technique and knowledge and applying it. And I'll show you these things now. <clears throat> First of all, you've probably all heard this famous notion of form and function. Form follows function, Dieter Rams, right? Well, nice, yes, and true. But let's see what actually happens um, if, you, if you get off balance with these things. We are saying, unless you know what your function is, you cannot find form. And I would totally agree with that. Never shape something um, without knowing what it has to do. Form means these things here. It, it, mean, it may mean even more things, but these are the ones I can think of. Form, in my opinion, is proportion, composition, reflectivity, radius, curves, surfaces, seams, dynamics, opacity, highlights, shadows, shadow lines, footprint, silhouette, and the question of masculinity and femininity. And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by these things a little later on here. And function are these things, ergonomics, haptics, I'm using aerodynamics here as a sample, blah, blah, blah. But you get the point. It's not as simple as form, function, okay? These are complex things in themselves and you need to know what they are and how you can tweak those. We'll do this now. First, let's look at what would happen if you make a completely functional object. Function, it just works. It works perfectly. Perfect, right? Every design school is happy. A wonderful thing like this. Beautiful, isn't it? Or you do the opposite and you go, yeah, function, uh, form, just form, beautiful, beautiful form. And you get this ridiculous thing, which is trying to be a motorcycle, but hey, you know, how? You know, you look at that, you tell me how that works. So these things need to be balanced. There needs to be as much form as function in everything. And then you get something like this. It's a motorcycle that looks nice and works well. And then you've got both of these kick, um, ticked. Right, let's examine function in detail. Ergonomics mean the physical needs of your users. Haptics means the physical feedback that you get when you touch it. You touch it, maybe it's warm. You touch it, maybe it's cold. You touch it, maybe it's soft. Maybe it's hard. Maybe it's uh, smooth. Maybe it's rough. All that is yours to decide. Here I use aerodynamics. What I really mean is the effect of the elements. What is the effect of the elements going to be on your object? If it's going to be a garden chair, well, what is UV light going to do to it over the years? Or water? 
life cycle is part of function. Today, you as a designer are not just designing what this thing is when it, you know, if it's a garden chair, you're not just designing what it does as a garden chair, you're also designing what happens to the virgin waste at the company that makes it. You are designing what happens to this chair when it ends up in the landfill 30 years down the road. This is all your job. And it is function. It is managing the afterlife of the product. And then there are the manufacturing constraints that are also part of the function. If, you, if you're going to be making this in serial production, well, there will be certain constraints and they, they form part of the function. <clears throat> so this is function. And then you have form. Now form, as I said, consists of all these different things and I'll run you through what they are. Proportion. What is proportion? Proportion is the relationship of size of the different components that make up the object. And you can make, you must make this, this choice very consciously. There are proportioning systems that let you choose the size of things in a way that is actually pleasing. This is a whole new science. Or just a new science, it's an old science. The Romans and the Greeks were the ones who came up with the golden section, for example. And if you use that well, you're coming out with objects that are going to look really nice because all the different bits that they're made of have a, a good looking visual relationship size wise to one another. This is quite similar to composition. Although composition is more about the relationship in maybe shape or, or angle that objects take toward another. This also can be created with a lot of purpose. And I find this Eames chair here, a very good example of an object that uses composition. So it actually consists of two objects and they simply have a wonderful, a wonderful flow together because um, they, they look great together. That's what the idea is behind composition. Objects that look great together because they're grouped in a way that still makes you feel, yeah, they belong together even though they're detached. Reflectivity is a term you might know from CAD modeling. It's about how mirror-like a surface is. And it's beautiful to have high reflectivity. The thing is though, it's never it's never just either reflective or it's not. Um, there are degrees of reflectivity and you want to find just the right one. Clearly a car paint needs to be very reflective because the you know the, the glossier it is, the more wonderful the car is. But sometimes such high reflectivity just isn't right for an object and you need to find the right degree of reflectivity in your surface. Radii or a radius. You may not be aware of it, but pretty much all objects that come out of factories have not edges, but a radius. The radius may be as indicated here, you know, it might be on the corner if you're looking at a shape like a mobile phone. But also the actual edges along the sides are um, equipped with what they call an edge radius. And you as a designer decide how big that edge radius has to be so that it looks right. Sometimes these edge radii are incredibly small. Like if you if you have a laptop, for example, what you're looking at as an edge is a radius, and this may be a radius of maybe 0 0.2 millimeters. Yeah, We do this because it is literally nonsense to have an edge. An edge will cut people. You don't want that. So, yeah, here is what I was just talking about, the mobile phone. A bit late there with my graphic, sorry. Curves. This um, is also a misunderstood term. 
<clears throat> a curve is a line whose curvature accelerates. And that's what makes it different from a radius. Yeah. Curve is getting tighter and tighter and tighter, or wider and wider and wider, whichever way you see it. And you can use curves to create a sense of direction. And you also need to be aware that every time you put a kink in a curve, you're actually starting another curve and you're slowing down the curve. Now, I'm a car designer and we never do that. You don't put kinks in curves. You know, the, the, the more cleanly your curve runs, the faster your shape looks and the cleaner it looks and it's what you want. You're creating surfaces and the surface will obviously have a consistency. Uh, this is a very nice uh, staircase. <clears throat> it's completely unnecessary to link up the uh, steps as the designer has done it here. But it's beautiful. It gives us a continuity of surface of a type that um, you wouldn't expect. And it is unavoidable that on your surfaces you will have seams where you join up material. So this is how materials meet. And the way the materials meet <clears throat> Is something you control. You could leave a gap. You could try to close the gap. You could uh, celebrate the fact that two materials are joined by putting something else on, like a piece of siding or something. You're expressing dynamics through form. Yeah, you're basically saying there is a direction to things. When you're looking at this object, Convention would dictate that we think of this as moving to the right, don't we? Because when we're looking at animal heads, vehicles, they're all kind of made for aerodynamics. And uh, this is the aerodynamic shape here that, that we're looking at. So it's saying this thing is moving to the right. And we use this when we create objects that have a direction that they're moving into or that they're supposed to be moving into. Like even if it's not a vehicle, even if it's an object, if it's a bottle opener, still you have certain directions in which they are supposed to be applied and your form should express that. Vehicles do this best, as I said. And even in this vehicle, you can tell which way is the front because convention helps us. You can see the red light here is always at the back, right? So we know this is the back. And it's also hunching towards the front. That's also a vehicle convention. You choose the opacity that also goes in, <clears throat> which means how well you can see through it. So the extent to which you can see through something is part of form and part of something that you decide as a designer. You're also expected to define the course of the highlights. Highlights are little glistening lights, reflections that form because of the shape. And it's never a coincidence. You can see these bright white lights on top of the wheels here of the vehicle. That's not an accident. Whoever shaped this body wanted them to be there because that's where they look good. That's what we do. We also do that with shadows. Shadows are a good way to yeah, lend some uh, substance to the form. They are the opposite of light. So if you have light, you have to have shadow. It also anchors the shape to the ground. And this here, in this case, without the shadow, I think we would struggle to understand what this even is, right? So thanks to the shadow, we do know. And we also apply shadow lines. 
So shadow line is a little accent, a dark accent that forms due to the shape. You can see in this in this body here, there are some shadow lines here. This could also almost be one, but that's the lighting. So this here is mostly a shadow line. It's a crease, an indentation, whose only purpose is to cast a shadow to give the body a bit more 3D shape. There will be the footprint, as you're sometimes looking at objects from above, aren't you? And when you're looking at something from above, it also needs to look good. Some objects you look at from above, some you don't. You know, chairs you may be looking at from above when you're pulling them out from under the table. Computer mice, something like that. And a close relative to that is the silhouette. A silhouette is what you see against the light when you see nothing else. So here's a silhouette, good looking silhouette of a piece of furniture. There's nothing hanging out. It's a closed silhouette. We want the silhouette to flow. You don't want anything dangling out or sticking out. Whatever you see along the outer boundary of this is, is, is intended and ideal. And then there is the question, is it going to be a boy or a girl? And it's a simple thing, really. <clears throat> we are somehow conditioned to expect angular things to be male and round things to be female. So which of these two is the female bottle, do you think? I know it sounds like a, <clears throat> like a boring stereotype, <clears throat> but it is actually how it, how it really is. Uh, in nature also, it's always the, or usually, the, the the male animals are less rounded and and a bit bigger so let's go to this actual point of beauty is it beautiful how can we make an object beautiful i think there is a bit of a recipe for this I think it's beautiful when society largely agrees at its proper time that is beautiful. Uh, these are ABBA, and they used to be considered really beautiful people at the time, also with that dress. Now, I think our tastes have moved on a little. <clears throat> so what I'm trying to say with this is that beauty can be a temporary thing. <clears throat> Sorry about that. You can also get pieces that are timelessly beautiful, or at least people agree that they're timelessly beautiful. So there is a strong element of convention in here. You can use that as a designer. If, if you know people like certain things, try to derive some traits from it. It could also simply be officially beautiful because a lot of weird people agree. Now, this is Jackson Pollock. And I'm not sure what you're thinking here, but me, I wouldn't want a Jackson Pollock painting in my bedroom um, because I, I don't think they look that wonderful. But there will be a lot of art critics who go, oh my God, a Jackson Pollock. Oh, I want to have one. So there's a lot of that going on in the arts. And we cannot plan that. This simply isn't plannable for us designers. So we, we cannot really hope to make something that looks like the things we've just seen and, and hope people will go for it because all, uh, these pieces became famous and beautiful for other reasons, not because they're intuitively wonderful and people immediately go for them. So don't do that. But what you can do is you can build appreciation that is also what made these things beautiful. Yeah, ABBA was considered beautiful because people liked their music. Jackson Pollock is considered beautiful because he dared do something pretty outrageous. You can build appreciation as a designer. And here's how. First of all, 
<clears throat> create attraction to your product. We humans tick very simply. We will easily desire something if it does all this. If you've read your fairy tales, you know exactly what I mean. If it's shiny, if it's colorful, if it makes you wonder what it is, if if you make if if you feel curious about it, if it has gradients in it. Gradients are what happens when you know you change from one color to another or from one color uh, darkness to a lighter color lightness <clears throat> so that that is how you can create desire very simply there are objects out there where i think most people would agree that they are beautiful and they follow that recipe that i've just shown you they're shiny they make you wonder what on earth is it they're uh, yeah, I like like little jewels in their own right. Saha Hadid has created a lot of objects like those. And I do think that there is something inside us that will pick up on something being beautiful um, without us being to explain logically why. Lots of beautiful things out in the world for different reasons. Uh, this furniture is very different from the Zaha Hadid yacht you saw on the previous slide, and yet it is beautiful. It, it is beautiful also because of its, it's an interesting shape. The eye has something to do. You can follow the lines. Here, in my opinion, the most beautiful car ever built. And all these objects follow that same recipe that I showed you just now. They, they are you know, shiny, they're uh, using form in a way that makes you want to go and investigate. And they may make reference to things that we find attractive quite inherently. Damino Bertoni, who designed the Citroën DS that you can see here, um, actually once admitted, from what I remember in an interview, that his main source of inspiration for the body of this vehicle was the female form. So this is basically a woman on wheels, right? Pretty clever, huh? And you don't have to do that, though. You can also simply make it extremely clear and clean, like a, a piece of machinery where everything is honest and has its purpose. Here's a Hasselblad camera, which does that very well. So beauty means you're providing the perceptual experience of pleasure or satisfaction. And we can also find uh, yeah, biological beings beautiful, as you know, even if they're extremely artificial, like here in this movie Avatar, or simply an environment, because there are things in it that we, we uh, approve of. Good colors, good geometry, good layout, Beauty is comprised of many different components, and you may not need every single one of them to create a piece of beauty. Maybe you can get your um, user to use the senses to experience the beauty of something. And our senses are, as we know, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. Let's use this car interior to investigate what it actually is that our senses are doing in this, in this, in, in this artificial environment. So sight, how does sight make us experience the beauty of this interior? You have all your highlights. We have talked about highlights. You've distributed them strategically all over this interior. That's part of the visual beauty of it. You also have their opposite, the shadows. They create the contrast that make the highlights pop out even more. And then you have contours. There are lines, or perceived lines going through the interior that your eye can follow. You choose your colors and you choose them well. Color in itself is a lecture topic that probably I should do a separate one on. 
just a simple tip to make it tasteful I would say never use primary colors and always make sure that you mix enough black and enough white into your colors and you should come out with uh, fairly pastel -y looking things that will match up with each other quite easily. Hearing, like I said before, when you're using a car these days, the acoustic experience is fully designed. There will be noises everywhere in the vehicle as soon as you activate things and somebody has given great thought as to what these noises might be. Right? Taste? Does your car taste like anything? Mine doesn't. I haven't licked any part of my car yet, so I think we can omit that one. Smell, though. I would say we would agree that the, the desired smell of a car is evocative of leather and steel. Engineering. And then there's the whole spectrum of touch experiences that you have inside your vehicle. So you want certain things to be smooth. You want certain things to feel cold because you're only touching them briefly. You may want some things to be warm to the touch because you're touching them for a longer time. You're always in contact with them. Some things need to be soft, some things need to be hard. So this altogether is called user experience or UX. And it's defined as follows. User experience basically summarizes a person's behaviors, attitudes and emotions about using a product, system, or service. And that includes the practical, the experiential, and the effective aspects of interaction and ownership. So it's not just using it, it's also being the person who owns this. If it's a system, the perceptions are more about utility, ease of use, and the efficiency of the system. Association, as I mentioned earlier, is a really strong contributor to the building of beauty, appeal, attraction in your object. Here on the left we see a Jaguar and here on the right we also see a Jaguar. And isn't it lovely how they have somehow managed to put the character of that big cat into that car. When you, when you look at these two images, um, these two things somehow really make sense together. The Jaguar has, the vehicle has the same eyes as the animal. Um, it has a nose. Um, every, everything about this vehicle is feline and Jaguar-like. These are... Um, similarities in, in form that are doing this. You may have heard of the cult object. <clears throat> cult objects exist and they have a following that is irrational really because um, often these cult objects are not all that good. I would think Zippo lighter is pretty good but the Willys Jeep, yeah, you know, it was probably good at its time, but we have much better vehicles now. Still, it is hugely desirable, this vehicle, to a certain group of people. And this is simply because there is a lot of history attached to these things. The Willys Jeep is simply the vehicle of the Americans in the Second World War, and so is the Zippo Lighter. So what makes these objects cult isn't the objects and how they're designed. It's the story and the context around them that makes that happen. And sadly, you cannot really make that happen as a designer unless you are in the right place at the right time and you see your chance. 
So these are all the factors contributing to appreciation. Let's construct beauty. Let's make it strategically beautiful. First of all, know your proportioning systems. You may have heard the name Fibonacci. If not, look it up. Wikipedia, Fibonacci. Um, fascinating. It boils down to if it's really supposed to be beautiful, you need to get a little bit into mathematics and measurements. And you will find that beauty reflected in nature, or these mathematics are creating that beauty in nature. We have the golden section. <clears throat> it's very simple. The ratio of length to width should be 1 to 0 0.618. And this is derived from a curious fact. If you measure the first phalanx of your finger, and then the second, and then you divide one of these values through the other, you arrive at exactly this number. And this isn't just your fingers. This is all the other parts of your body, and not just your body. This is also about animals. This is about plants. So... This is the proportioning formula of life as we know it on this planet. It may well be the formula of proportioning of life generally in the universe. We don't know that, though, because we haven't seen any other life yet from other planets. I'm looking forward to the day when we do. The first thing I'll do is I'm going to start measuring these guys up and start calculating. This has been used to great success in architecture. This is the White House, and you may sometimes wonder why some buildings look great and some don't. And that's simply because if you use these proportions, you're going to end up with something that looks fantastic. It makes it immediately acceptable to the human eye. And there are product designers who have done this. Here, this is how Fibonacci has been applied to um, an iPhone. So people are using this. If you're into this kind of stuff, check out these four. I'm not going to show these to you now, but geomancy, sacred geometry, anthroposoph anthroposophy, and the golden angle. <clears throat> they also give you um, yeah, handles like that. To construct a surface properly, you have to do certain things. We've talked about radius. You need to know what a radius is, right? A radius has a center, and it creates, well, I wouldn't want to say a curve, because it's not a curve, it's something else. It creates a line that always keeps the same distance to the center. And a curve is that just squished or stretched. Okay, so the line accelerates and is not keeping the same distance to the center. You will have a seam in your surface, and you will have highlights in your surface, as you see here at the top of that rectangle. Now here we have an image, a computer image, um, where I can show you all these things. Here we have a curve. If you draw a section through this body, you get this curve. And it's an accelerating line, as you can see. It is flatter at the top than at the bottom. The radius, you see it there. It runs along that edge. It's an edge radius. See, a lot of things with doors and flaps have seams. And when you're looking at car doors, for example, you may wonder, why do they run like this? Why do they have this curvature? What's the purpose? Well, that is part of our job. We create these seams and how they run. Yeah, these are the seams I'm talking about. And you create exactly where they curve. And especially with a body like a vehicle, the idea is to always make it look like you are looking at a wide-angle object. There's a 
There is a French word called bombé, which explains that very well. It basically means that you have a, a body that is bulging in all directions. That's what we are doing when we are applying these lines in this way. <clears throat> Here's a nice example of uh, seams between material. It seems like there is a continuity of material, but the seams are really um, visible. So they, they are visible, but not too visible. I hope you know what I mean. You just have to find exactly the right distance of components to each other to make it look like it's a, it's a nice seam. All these bits here, right? The highlights before. Here on this vehicle, we see the highlights here. And they were put there on purpose because we want the upper areas of the vehicle to be very glistening and very visible as the upper areas. Now, haptic engineering. This is about making it right to the touch. You can plan your surface touch. You can make it hard, rough, give the texture, or even the temperature, if you will. If you touch wood, it feels different than touching metal, doesn't it? Because of the conductivity of the material. And you choose that. There's a weighting, yeah, a certain balance. If you're picking up a telephone receiver, you'll want that to have a certain weight, a certain reassuring weight. You don't want a super light, flimsy one, and you don't want it to be heavier at one end than at the other. So think about where in your object you might need to include a few lead weights and also the force of activation. When you're pushing a button, just how much resistance should there be? The resonance. Yeah, what, what happens when you activate it? Do you allow your object to have a vibration? Do you want your object to be floppy or do you want it to be rigid? They do a floppiness test with laptops. You know, when you when you take up a laptop like this and you pick it up, some of them start to droop on you. <laughs> and uh, so their rigidity is low. And I don't think that's intended. That's just unavoidable with some of these laptops. But my impression, my, my intention, my um, word on this would be that the right amount of rigidity for each object must be found. Then there are the dynamics of form that you when you're looking at this square, which way is it moving? Is it moving? Uh, we don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a very stationary form, and perhaps that's what you want, because it is a stationary object. In that case, by all means, make it this way. Or you want it to feel like it is moving, in a way. And this could be moving sideways. How about now? Which way is this moving? Maybe to the right, maybe to the left. I find this one really confusing. I couldn't say. This one here, I suppose if it's a ship, it would probably go to the right. If it's a land vehicle, it's probably going to the left because we are always assuming aerodynamics here. How about now? I, I think this is moving into the left lower corner of the screen because of its shape. Now, which of these is the faster shape? Probably the stretched one, right? They do this with vehicles as well. You'll find that um, the, the new model will always look a little faster. And this is done by straightening up the lines a little, cleaning up the clutter, and uh, yeah, making it, making it hunched down a little at the front. So you can see that here. On the left, you see the original vehicle, the original Fiat Cinquecento from the 1960s. 
and on the right you see a modern day version from the 2010s and it is actually abandoning the concept of the parallel lines also the unified the windows so it looks more together makes it look faster then there's the question of how well can you look through it here you can clearly see on the left this is an old toyota headlight on the right you have a bmw headlight the more recent one is it bmw i don't know what brand but the the more clear it is the more um yeah the the, the better it may look you know simple as that then here's the question is it a boy or a girl this is the same car this is a fiat 500 and the left one looks like it's owned by a man and the right one looks like it's owned by a woman why might that be well manly stuff is always looking supposedly a little more aggressive a little more angular and a little heavier and female stuff is always a little friendlier a little softer and a little lighter in weight shadows if i mean you cannot avoid a shadow right unless you're a vampire um, you have to live with the fact that there will be an, ob uh, an object shadow and you can use that to either make the object look heavy or light if you can look through underneath your object it may be perceived as light so if you want something to look light make sure it comes off the ground a little here we see that shadow lines that we've already talked about they are here these are all shadow lines now what do they do you know i mean were these people bored when they designed this no clearly not they put this in to articulate the shape a little bit imagine they were not there you would just have one smooth blob of a vehicle and it would look a lot higher and shorter than it does you do have to make vehicles look sleek and fast so this is the way to do it you put in these creases and it it creates the visual trickery to make you feel like your vehicle is actually a little longer than it really is also they tend to line these things up all over the vehicle these tend to actually go all the way around called line continuity so this is how form and function comes together and i hope you have found this lecture interesting and useful and maybe the odd thing in there can help you make a better looking object all the best